Look. There we go. You're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. This week we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers Outdoor Adventure Trailers.com. The best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Cutthroat Furled Leaders, the only leaders that I use. Cutthroat Furled Leaders are guaranteed to perform for whatever species of fish you're chasing. Check them out at CutthroatFurledLeaders.com. Save 15% promo kayak. StoneFlyNets.com, the very best in handcrafted and custom fishing nets made in the great state of Arkansas. Check out Stonefly Nets at StoneFlyNets.com. All right, gang, we are back again for another exciting episode of Kayak Flyer. And I tell you what, I'm going to have to put Rick from Oasis Benches on the payroll because he finds the best guests ever. Um, he's always calling me, Sean, you've got to get this guy on the, on the podcast. You got to get this guy on the podcast. And tonight we have Adam from Musky Town. And so this is really going to be an exciting podcast for you guys that fly fish for musky or that you're looking about predatory fish. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Adam, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. It's uh, it's great to be here. Oh, I tell you what, musky, man, that is the fish that everybody's been talking about. Musky and carp. It's like trout are the old news. Fly fishermen are after big fish. Um, what got you started into the uh, idea of a fly shop and and naming it Musky Town? Oh, where to start? I mean, that's a that's a lifetime of a story. Uh, but I'll try to hit the high notes. Uh, as a kid. I was old. How old was I? 10, 12 years old. Uh, I grew up fishing in Northern Wisconsin. Uh, my mom and my dad both worked. And during the summers, we'd go spend them with grandma uh, at the house. And, and the house is a, that's a generous term. It was an old barn turned house, uh, retrofit. There's parts of it that still aren't finished. It's, it's kind of the family hunting fishing camp now. Yeah. But uh, by the time I was 18, 19, I'd lost count of how many muskies I caught uh, on gear. And, you know, that's everything from top water, but usually it's like bucktails. Like, you know, we, we didn't have a, a lot of money. I, I come from nothing. And I, you know, as a kid, grandma would save a part of her social security check. And it was like, you can either go get 22 ammo or, you know, you can save up for a, a couple of few weeks and you can maybe get a new bucktail. So I uh, ended up getting uh, I, I'll never forget this black, red, and silver bucktail. Um, and this was this was right at like 12 or 13. And I, my, my cousin took me out and I threw a cast in. And I'd love to tell you that, you know, 12-year-old me held it together great and it all went really well. It did not. Uh, literally first cast ever chasing muskies uh, had a giant. Like my, my cousin still tells me it was a 50 plus inch fish. And it scared me so bad, I ripped the rod out of the water. Oh, man. <laughs> and so it was kind of one of those things where it was like, all right, we're not going to do that next time. And, you know, as I, I, by the time I went out to school, you know, I went to the University of Vermont and you don't have a ton of time. I, I played sports in college and, and kind of fishing and hunting took a back seat just to, you know, life. And... Yeah. After school, I, I lived in Vermont. I met my wife when I was a senior in, in college. We weren't married at that time, obviously, but uh, started fly fishing. And we were really fortunate. We had an incredible smallmouth fishery right up the street from us. And for seven years, I fished almost every day uh, of the season, uh, topwater smallies, not just like everything, but literally throwing frogs. And this yep. fishery was, I mean, you, you, it was so good that I thought I was a really good angler, right? Like you, you start to get overly confident. And, um, that was, you know, that started, I want to say at like 21, 22. Uh, and then a number of years later, I went fish the ditch pickle classic in Vermont, which anyone who, who fly fishes for, for smallies and for bass, um, it's an annual tournament they have out there that Lake Champlain is an incredible fishery, but it's completely different. Like you, you can't just go and fish shoreline stuff and think you're going to do well. Cause it's got a lot of shallows that extend a couple hundred yards from shore. And it's a lot of like open water structure fishing. And so <laughs> this is the part where I tell you about how I really got my ass handed to me. <laughs> uh, we, we fished this tournament, a buddy of mine and, and like we'd went and pre-fished it the week before and 
did really well actually we ended up catching like you know a couple dozen fish and everything from like both in to big large mouth small mouth like we were like oh we're gonna crush this tournament it's gonna be great so day before the tournament uh the wa water column flips like just stormy cold like one of these like you know vermont you can get random like 40 degree days and yeah. during the summer it doesn't happen often but it does happen and we struggled we, we caught like two nice smallies in the first 20 or 30 minutes of the tournament i was like oh here we go we're gonna crush this uh. and then it was just crickets for like <laughs> For, for two days straight so we're in the line i got my tail between my legs my buddy and i are like looking around nervously because like you know we have yeah. to be in the bottom of this tournament and the guy in front of us you know you make small talk with people at these things and start talking with how'd you guys do yeah you know we, we did all right you know that type of thing yeah and uh a uh, uh, buddy a few people back drops an expletive that i'm not going to say on a recorded podcast <laughs> because you you bleeper he goes, you win it again. And the guy we're talking to goes, yeah, yeah, yeah probably. And yeah. so that was kind of the very beginning. Um, that guy who we were making small talk with was a gentleman by the name of John Cooper. He's actually a Mainer, uh, also went to UVM. Uh, so we kind of hit it off there. And at the time, uh, I was I was playing poker professionally. That was my old uh, job then. And a few years later, we had our daughter and it was it was post Black Friday, uh, April 15th, 2012. Uh, a lot of the big online poker companies were laundering money and the mm. Department of Justice cleaned things up would be the tactful way to say it. But they locked up a bunch of money and, and it was kind of like you had to figure out what to do. And to give you an example, I went from playing about 700 online poker tournaments a week to having to drive up to Canada on the weekends to be able to play like 35. So it was like day trading wow. for 15 minutes a day and trying to earn a living and yeah. had a one year old daughter. And at that point it was like, how are we going to shift this? You know, what are we going to do? Uh, ended up taking an entry level digital marketing job in, in Maine. And when we moved to Maine, you know, I tried to keep in touch with John, the guy from uh, the dish pickle classic mm -hmm. and we started talking and then we met up and I'd started fly tying and, and, at this point, it was like, you know, all smallies all the time. And, you know, we, we get talking again. He's like, well, you know, a bunch of us meet every Tuesday during the winter and we tie musky flies. And it was like, oh, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely had our, have my attention. And uh, over the next number of years, and this is nearly a decade ago now, uh, we started tying flies. And these three guys, uh, John Cooper, Jeff Faulkner and, and Jeremy Boulier, a bunch of Mainers, call themselves the the Maine Muskie Mob. I, I got my coin from <laughs> when I we all went on a trip to Wisconsin, and I, I'll remember when I got my first, but um, first on a fly. And these guys, literally for four years, we'd sit there and I'll go to tie, and I'd we'd be kind of like this. I'd be sitting here with like a thread base on a shank or a hook, and I would ask a million questions, just yeah. like what do you do about this? Like, what, what do you do in this scenario? And it was like fishing, it was tying questions. And so uh, when we started talking then at that time, there was a, there were a few shops, like there was urban fly co was one that was David O'Sullivan. Sully owned it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, Sully is one of the OGs in the musky fly fishing space. Absolute machine. His, his 747s. I've heard it phrased his color wheel spins like no other. Um, <laughs> we tied with Sully one night. And there were other people who, at that time, it was kind of the Wild West. Like everybody was competing, but it was kind of a weird situation because I didn't understand why they were competing. Like, I, you know, anyone who ties flies, like it's like candy, right? You want a little yeah. bit of everybody's candy. And all these guys thought that they were like competing with each other. And yeah. this was, you know, at this point, I'm trying to figure out how old I was then. And it was, again, real close to a decade ago. We're talking and it was like, we started talking about a predator fly shop, you know, just, just flies at that point. Um, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we'd sell flies? And, and it was about like helping all these guys that were competing, right? It was like, well, they, once everyone realizes you're not competing anymore, then it's yeah. just fun. Yeah. And so that was when we first started talking about it. Um, fast forward, I would say seven, eight years to... You know, I, I'm working a marketing job. At this point, I had a, a gotten a, an offer down in Atlanta, Georgia to go work at a marketing agency with like 
the big dog companies, Coca-Cola, Porsche, Stanley Black and Decker, like all the big ones. And that was really cool. And I was, I was good at it, but I wasn't really happy. And for the better part of, I'm trying to think of that point, it a year and a half, the second year and a half of being there, um, I was working 80 plus hour weeks. And then I was working another 20 plus hour, like every bit of spare time working on Musky Town. So it started with, okay, we're going to carry flies, but people are going to want to have, you know, access to sweet rods and lines and, and reels and all that. And it just snowballed. It, it got completely out of control. So as the pandemic hit, um, I, at that point was bringing a patent pending virtual reality, augmented reality prototyping platform to market. So, um, intercontinental hotels group, the company that owns holiday Inn and a dozen other, uh, hotel brands, uh, they would prototype in virtual reality. So you put a headset on, you're in a hotel room rather than, you know, taking all the expenses of construction and going with that. Right. And it was really cool, but like, it was very forward thinking and our company made a, you know, let's just say we made a change. Um, it, it, we didn't see eye to eye on all the same things yeah. and, and that's fine. Like they, they're a traditional help people with their digital marketing company. And this was kind of a, a fringe thing. And so we, we went our separate ways and at this point, it was like, well, I finally know what I want to do when I grow up, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we launched, we, we started putting the pieces in place to really launch Muskie Town. And it has been nuts. We, we launched the site in February and we're growing like wildfire. Uh, I think we talked about before we started recording, mm-hmm. we've got like nine or 10 dozen flies to get out to folks. And, and thank you to everybody who's been patient waiting for their orders we, we get through them as fast as we can uh and, and we're making some other changes to be able to reduce those more and, and make it so people don't always have to wait so you know we we've added i don't want to say all but working on adding all of the the best you know fly line brands and rod reel brands uh we, we offer flies from you know some of the top tires in the world and a lot of these people are friends who, as I was going deep down the rabbit hole, took me under their wing. So yeah. it's been incredibly rewarding to be able to give you know those friends a platform, but also to see the the support from the community. Uh, all these people who Muskie were this elusive mythical beast when I was a kid, and now people can get whatever fly whatever piece of gear, whatever piece of expertise you want. And I, I, I like to call them what, you know, the artist formerly known as Prince, the, the fish the formerly known as the fish of 10,000 casts, because whereas that might be true with some gear instances on highly pressured water, it feels like it. Yeah. Um, with the fly rod, there's fisheries that I could confidently go to. I won't say tomorrow just because they're frozen right now. <laughs> but you could com- confidently go to it and expect to have a multi-fish day. And uh, I don't necessarily think that there's a lot of gear fisheries that you can do that with. No. Um, and I don't know if it has to do with how flies land softly or, you know, the different action or that, you know, we're purpose tying and building stuff to do certain things in the water. And like the innovation curve in musky fly fishing is tremendous right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, just in Wisconsin, Minnesota anymore either, right? There, there's people, there's incredible fisheries in Ohio, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina. Um, there's folks that are dedicating their time fishing to going after tigers in Utah, in Colorado, and, you know, places that didn't have musky fishing, um, or at least in any known way. So we're one at a really exciting part of the learning curve as a community uh, but two, it's kind of, it's becoming a community now. It's not just a dozen, you know, I, I say guys, we're, we like to be really inclusive because it's not just guys that do it, but what started with a dozen guys really in the world going after muskies, uh, has turned into thousands of people comparing notes and really pushing the craft. It, it's, it's been amazing. So long long-winded answer to how how musky town came to be but uh 
it's it, it's taken a lifetime to get to this yeah. point and it, it's every single part of of my life has gone into it at this point yeah you know it was it was funny I like like so many people when you start fly fishing it was all about trout you know it was it was you fly fished for trout and you know then I got figured out and talked to you know talked to a couple of my friends that were older than me and wiser than me and so warm water fish you know smallmouth bass and the rivers around here really became my focus and so I fly fished for those for years um as a matter of fact this is the first well I guess last year 2021 was the last year that I or the first year I tied anything smaller than I think a size 10 so I'm, I mean I'm, that was I'm a, never doing that if I can avoid it I had any good nights as well I'm just saying good night. Yeah, um, that's fine. You usually see a hand reach through with a beer from mine. They're older though. <laughs> yeah, if you could have them reach and pass one over here, that would be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a uh, you know carp fishing has become really a a big deal. Um, I know oh, I Dan carp. and a lot of those guys. You know, carp. It's it's. I think people are realizing anymore that it's not just about trout. You know, if it, if you can catch it, you know, gar, gar become a big thing, catching gar on a fly rod, you know, I mean, you get a 10 weight fly rod and you get out there and you go after some of these big fish that are non-conventional sport fish. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. What do you, what do you have for gar near you? I've got a couple of really clean rivers that have quite a bit of gar in them. Um, I haven't targeted them because it sort of depends on where you're at. Long um, nose or, or what kind of gar? Uh, alligator gar and long nose. Oh, you have alligator too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucky dog. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's a, it's something else. We've got, if I had a boat with a motor, I'd feel more comfortable because I'm literally less than a mile from the Mississippi River. And so we have a big drainage ditch that cuts through and drained all the swamp out. And um, all of those backwash rivers and creeks are all just full of carp and gar um just absolutely full but i don't want to take my kayak down the diversion channel and, and hope that i can get back into the, the pull off before i go into the river <laughs> that, that's a good call yeah a lot of the carp waters uh, and some of the sluices around here are like that um, yeah yeah you don't want to gets... fall into it yeah <laughs> no no they're, they're big and they got a lot of teeth yeah and they're they're ornery uh um, yeah we, we have a guy in texas who uh his name is Ryan King. I had to double check if I'm, I'm getting either part of that right. I think that's accurate. Um, catches a bunch of big alligator guard. We've talked some theory about, you know, what's working for him. And we're trying to kind of shift the gar space away from rope flies. Uh, yeah. I don't want to take credit for that. But, you know, there was a while where that was the only way people could get them to eat. And yeah. What happens when your line breaks and their jaws are sealed shut? Right. Um, yeah. That's and, the and, biggest concern with me with trying to target gar because – I don't know of another good way that you would catch one. And I sure don't want to break a tippet and have that fish, you know, die. There you know? are some hooks that we would be happy to talk about. Um, okay. I, mean, I guess we can do it like on yeah. here. Yeah. Now. We can talk um, about it now. Yeah. It's a, a good venue. Sorry, yeah. people. We're going to talk about this about you. <laughs> and it's, no, I'm just playing. Um, so yeah. Uh, light wire, strong hooks. A-Rex has some great options. Uh, the gap on some of the new swim bait hooks accomplishes some of what we've been trying to figure out, but you know, these fish are so big, they don't, they don't tail nip, you know, they're yeah. not just hitting like a muskie that wants to hit center mass. Um, so yeah, I mean, anything light wire and strong A-Rex really is, I think the first hook that we recommend for that. I've also had good luck with like, uh, Gamakatsu B10S stingers, just like basic, they're thin, they're razor sharp you know chemically sharpened but uh a whole stack of them laying right here in size one <laughs> well and i think that once you accept that some of these fish are so bony mouth that you're just not going to get a hook into them and that's just part of it yeah you're not going to get any shortage of eats so that's that's fine i mean i, I don't want to act like gar my expertise because they're not like I, right. I the only experience that i have with them is mostly around long nose gar uh which when it gets too hot to fish for muskies in, in Tennessee, North Carolina, and, and in the Midwest too, it's uh, something to pass the time with. And more than that, because you know, they're going to be in all these stale shallows and yep. it's sight fishing and man, they're fast. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the great thing. I mean, it's, 
you know, they're when you find them and you know where they're at and you've sort of got an idea of which waters they're on, you know, when nothing else is biting, they're out there that you can go after. Yeah. Do you guys have spots near you? Uh, spotted bass. Yeah. 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 I like yeah. spotted bass fishing yeah. too. They're, they're a fun species somewhere yeah. between a large mouth and a smallie for anyone who doesn't fish for them. Yeah. We've actually got, um, we call, yeah, there are spots. We call them, uh, a lot of times we'll call them uh, Kentucky bass around here because I think that's, I don't, I have no idea, but, um, that's a bass species that competes directly with the smallmouth, and they grow faster. And so you'll catch a lot of those on a day that you're out catching for smallies. Interesting. And, and at, if competition wise in your fisheries, are they, sorry, I'm going to just, Oh no, you're fine. I got an email on the next side of it. Um, Depending competition on, wise, do they out predate the smallies? Like, is, in, it, is it a problem yeah. in a native fishery? Yeah. And the smaller rivers, it seems like you'll catch three to one spots. Over oh, wow. smallies. Are they native by you too? I don't think so. I, yeah, I, that's I don't know if they are or not, but it's, you know, and luckily, you know, here in, in Missouri, we've got a lot of guys and, you know, it's their, it's their right and they can do it. And, you know, we get a lot of guys that catch and keep fish. Um, you know, luckily most of the fish they're catching are not smallies. They're the spots. So that, that definitely helps, you know? And so <laughs> I know like my brother-in-law for one, he and I have talked about it. He's gotten to the point now he throws back all the smallies, but he keeps all the spots, you know, and they're generally bigger you know, just because they grow faster. You know, it's an interesting spot because <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> uh, where <laughs> God, I'm like a five-year-old and like somebody just said like <laughs> the worst joke. Um, but no, no pun intended, but talking about like uh, knowledge and, and native fisheries and the species, um, there's one thing that you know, I want to make sure to draw attention to, and it's just interesting, but like, we all know there's a lot of misinformation in fishing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, walleye fishing specifically, like there's, there are a lot of anglers that dedicate all of their fishing time to walleyes. And in Tennessee, there are a couple pretty well-known spots. If you Google that are, I would almost call them like mega musky fishing spots not necessarily because they're more productive, but because of access, like people can yeah. drive to them and there are fish that eat there sometimes. But one of the problems there is that it's also a, a really good, uh, walleye fishery. And I, I'm going to be vague about what fishery that is intentionally, right. but, um, what I've seen a few different times and it just, it's, it's heartbreaking when it happens is, Typically, it's a, a generational someone who's been fly, you know, not fly fishing, but just the gear fishing for walleyes their whole life. They'll actually float suckers on balloons and catch muskies and then just like gut them and throw them on the shore. Oh, and it's terrible because like I'm, I've seen it twice now. And yeah. my response when it happens in person is much different than this education campaign that we're on yeah. right now. It's, yeah. it's aggressive. But yeah. the reality is that when asked, why are you doing that? It's, well, I'm here to catch walleyes and they kill the walleye fishery. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a misunderstanding of these species that have, you know, muskies have all these teeth and they're scary to people who don't fish for them. And right. the reality is that they're almost like selective grim reapers in a fishery. And that's a terrible <laughs> terminology, but it, they, they eat the sick and the yeah. wounded and they, they, they clean up these ecosystems. Like muskies are like the opposite of bad yeah. for fishery. Like they, they make it so that a species, you know, that there aren't too many bass in a fishery or, or you know, they, they, they're only going to eat walleyes that are injured. And obviously there's exceptions to that, but right. like generally speaking, it's important to clarify some of the misinformation around muskies is like, they're really good for ecosystems. Like there's a reason that so many muskie anglers myself included fish entirely catch and release for this species. Yeah. And it's because they help every fishery they're in. They, yeah. It's different than a pike. Like pike will, they're greedy and they will destroy <laughs> a fishery. And like, I don't necessarily have the same sentiment toward someone, in, you know, in Utah or Montana, who's been a trout angler their whole life, like learning that pike it in and they're like, you know, kill them all. Like that's, yeah. I may not have the exact same opinion, but I can empathize with that. Um, right. 
But anyway, yeah, it's just it's, an interesting point when we're talking about non-native species and, and like, you know, trying to guide conservation for a specific species like Smalley. Like yeah. if you're a yeah, walleye angler, tell anyone you know that like muskies are actually good for your fishery, not yeah. the opposite. Yeah, there's, there's one river that I go to, I try to make it to each year and, um, it's about a four hour drive, but when you go down through it, it's just, it's smallmouth heaven, just absolute heaven for smallmouth. But there's about a mile stretch where it's just full of gar. And I mean, you'll look down and there'll be 20 or 30 of them, but to watch one of those swim around with about a 12, 14 inch smallie in its mouth, you know, they're, they're getting stuff too. And it's, you know, and like I said, it could be you know, I'm just looking down and seeing this giant smallie hanging out of a gar's mouth, but you don't know if that one was wounded, if there was something wrong with it, if it was, you know, if it wasn't that healthy, you know, so whenever you make judgments about things, killing stuff, it's always best to stop, look and evaluate the situation. Because if you don't have those apex predators in there at the rivers not, or the fisheries not necessarily as good as it could be. That That's a great point. I mean, how long have those gar been there and how long, you know, what percentage of the smallmouth population or, or other species population are they eating? Like if that's normal and they've been doing it for centuries, then yeah. who are we to get in their way? Um, yeah, that's that's kind of what, yeah, it's kind of the way it is. It's, you know, they're, they have been there. It's not like they're not native to that river, you know, they're, and the populations are fine because we can go down there and hooting and holler and everything else we want to on it on a float trip river mainly but there's like three miles of it that's just incredible fishing and so we do the float trip and then we wind up fishing the last three miles and it's it's a great time but so, there's no lack of fish so when, when when i make it out there and we fish together i would like to spend at least a mile and a half of that before we get into smallies oh yeah yeah it's it <laughs> it gets it's a it's pretty good it's a pretty good river <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it sounds like you got a good one over there. Uh, I've got We've some got, other friends in Missouri yeah. and, and they really, they rave yeah. about the quality of the fishery there. I mean, it's yeah. lucky dog. Yeah. We've got a couple of rivers. We've got one. It's like two and a half hours door to door. Like literally the, I open my door to my truck and I get out down there and it's, uh, it's great. Um, but man, it becomes a party river. It becomes a, an absolute party river, but you can catch <laughs> bass, walleye, trout. I mean, everything. It's just, it's a wonderful river, but man, oh said, man. When you said party river, that wasn't what I pictured because a, a friend, <laughs> a friend in Wisconsin put a picture, I put a post on social media recently about they went out fishing and they didn't necessarily look what was going on. And they're yeah. like hundreds of tubers on the river that's, and they're like yep. trying to fish under the tubers so when you said party river that was what i pictured yeah. oh no that's what it is that's what it is you've got to get down there and fish like of a morning and then you just sit down with your cooler and your lawn chair in the water and watch everybody go by and it's yeah it's it's the girls who go woo <laughs> that's it's funny. it's it's mardi gras on water it's I, it's incredible you know it, it's funny when i i see that stuff because I realize I'm in the minority with this, but you know, I met my wife as a 21 year old kid in college, yeah. right? Like that's yeah. so, you know, I, I think I've been tubing precisely one time and a friend brought their underage brother and the kid drank too much. And I was like, still and it. Like it ended up being one of these situations. I mean, God, this was more, this was 15 years ago yeah. and, and no one knew the kid was drinking. And it was one of those situations where it was anyway, not much of a partier. <laughs> I don't hold anything any, against anyone who is. Oh. And certainly helps to have some uh, celebratory beverages yeah. on the boat sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's funny because you know you'll be fishing for trout, and then you know you know about the time the first drop off is going to be, and so you'll just sort of stop, and you'll let a group of people go through. Then you'll catch some more trout, and then you'll let some people go through. Then you'll catch some more trout. It doesn't mess with the fishing for you. They are so used to it. It's just, cool. it's incredible. It is, it is absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really high destination place, but you know, other fisheries, you know, you can't say that for, but this one, you know, it's got walleye and bass and there's always good places to fish. It's, it's really neat river and they're doing a lot to move it up to be on the same, um, scale as the white river there in Arkansas. So they're oh, really working fantastic. hard to make it a destination. Really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's interesting cause home base being in Georgia and I travel a ton. Like I usually have to figure out where I am in the morning and that just has to do with the old work life and just, you, you had a lot of relationships and part of it is my parents live in different places and, and going mm -hmm. around, but North Georgia is known for blue ribbon trout water. Mm -hmm. like they, it's an incredible fishery. Um, 
it's not as well known for some of the really high quality striper fishing that it has seasonally. Right. Um, in certain fisheries, like striper are the primary go-to, like mm -hmm. I can say Lake Lanier, like striper fishing there is incredible. Like I've, I've had days out there where I've caught so many fish that my arms hurt and yeah. I yeah. like quit and I lost count like hours ago. Um, uh, and there's some big ones too. Like I I've been, I've spent two and a half, three years at this point throwing musky gear at them in giant glider flies at cows. Like I want to catch 40 inch plus stripers and dial that in and, and I'm close. Like I'm starting to get trucked almost every single time out. And I'm not sure why, but they're hitting these giant gliders and they're missing the hooks, which makes me oh. think they're not trying to eat. It makes me think they're trying to tackle. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're just anyway, mad running it off. Yeah. And I got to figure that out. Cause it's, I don't know if you've ever like watched a 40 inch plus striper, like 40 inch plus muskie is cool and they're awesome to catch, but 40 inch striper, the fight is no comparison. Like anyone who yeah. says otherwise, like I, I love muskie fly fishing. I love the species. I, 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 there's something in the mystique and challenge of it all, but catching a 40 plus inch striper is like, I, I actually, I've never caught a 40 plus inch striper, but I have buddies yeah. who've done it on an eight weight and it took them like an yeah. hour and a half. And they're like, yeah. dude, you got to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking. It's, you know, it's like catching a bull red on a, on a 10 weight. You just strap in and go with it. Hold on know? tight. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. man. Um, uh, so about muskies and, and before we get, get too far off for folks that, you know, like me, I'm there. Are, there are musky. I'm, I know there are musky in part of and part of the state of Missouri. I know there's musky over in Illinois. What no. would I need to do? What would I be looking at as the average um, trout and bass fly fisherman? What would I be looking at and needing to be successful with musky? How how could you give me advice for that? First off, this shows why they pay you the big bucks for being <laughs> show host because that's a great question. Uh, where to start? I think the first place to start is there's some folks that say you can fish with an eight weight rod for musky. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that there are certain eight weight rods in some circumstances where you're throwing small enough flies where that's doable. I wouldn't recommend it as a place to start. Um, not because you can't do it, but more because you have to think about the stresses that you're putting on an apex predator that isn't used to having any predation. Like they don't have natural predators in a fishery. So when you catch in some fisheries, that'll be a, a 30s inch fish in other fisheries. That's a 50s inch fish or bigger. Um, when you catch that biggest fish in an ecosystem, you can damage it like a lot yeah. of, you know, you can die it if you don't take the time to revive it. And otherwise, so all that to say, um, 10 weight rods, uh, lines that load and cast them well, um, there are a few different options you have. Uh, uh, the scientific angler sonar Titan lines have really nice, short, heavy heads that turn over big flies. Um, if you're fishing them on a 10 weight, you're going to want something in the 380 to, you know, 450 tops range. Like 450 is usually 11 weight territory in some of the mm -hmm. current day fast rod uh, world. 100 yards of 30 pound backing, you really don't see your backing with musky yeah. fly fishing. Um, and, and realistically, let's let's use salt as the comparison because I do a lot of saltwater fishing mm -hmm. too. Um, just making a note to revisit <laughs> Flats Town because we didn't talk about that. Yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you are, you know, if you're flats fishing and you're throwing an eight weight, you're going to be using a reel that you want to have 200 pounds or 200 yards, pardon me, of. 20 to 30 pound backing, just depending yeah. on the species, at least because like a bonefish makes blistering runs and whatever. But if you're fishing for musky, you can get away with using like an eight or a nine weight reel sometimes because realistically, like there's been situations where we have customers that are like, Hey, I'm on a budget and I want to do this. I have this seven weight reel. I really, you know, like we all have lives. Some people have kids, some people have mm -hmm. other budget realities. I have a seven weight reel. What can I do? Well, I wouldn't recommend it usually, but you can put 20 yards of 30 pound backing on and you can attach your fly line. And if it doesn't all fit, wrap it around the outside of the reel until you yeah. fish next time, because it's usually not going to live there. Um, 
but typically speaking, I really like a, a 10 weight rod and, and there's a ton of really good options. If you want to get into models, happy to, uh, a 380 to 400 grain line, 30 pound backing, hundred yards, uh, depending on the weight of the reel. Like I really like the, uh, not an intentional product plug, but I'm going to make it anyway. Go ahead. Yeah. The new TFO NTR reels are incredible. Um, <laughs> I, I use the the NTR four on. I've used it for both musky uh, and also uh, barracuda at this point. And oh wow! I don't know if you've ever seen a barracuda on the line, but uh-huh. they they literally go like fifteen feet in the air while you're while you have them on the end of your line, and it's like nothing you've ever experienced. Like just the yeah. raw speed. So they have a really strong drag but they're light enough that like I'll use the four, the the bigger version of that reel for a musky combo, but only because mm-hmm. it's so light, not because I have to. Right. Um, and then flies. I think, is there, am I leaving anything out before we get to flies? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, you're, uh, you've got to have a quality uh, leader and then a, a wire tip it, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely want to have wire bite guard. Um, so leaders, I guess, yeah, let's get into leaders too, because I, I think yeah. that's important. Uh, you can go longer, but I, I typically like a really short, le- stout leader. Um, 40 pounds of fluoro or mono. It's got enough uh, stiffness to turn over a fly and kind of carry on that energy from your fly line. But I'll usually, I, I usually run a three foot uh, fluoro leader with a like a really big perfection loop on the end. I run loop to loops right. and I, I do some saltwater stuff. Like I'll, yep. I'll whip a loop in my fly line to support the welded loops. And, you know, today's welded loops, they're usually pretty strong. I haven't heard of a lot of failures, but uh, most of my gear gets used everywhere. So just at a habit, I reinforce stuff and I, my OCD is strong. Like it, it's <laughs> way, it's beyond strong. Like my OCD is, a, it gets a little rough sometimes like overbelts the play. Um, so I'll usually run a three to four feet of 40 pound floral. You can go shorter even. It's like two and a half probably is the bottom end to 18 inches of knotable wire. And depending on the fishery, if you're not a high density fishery where your fish are going to be in that, 30 to 40 inch range usually uh then i'll run like 28 pound uh knotable wire like one by seven stuff and and scientific anglers has a really great camo one Mm -hmm. um there's some other options too for bigger fisheries where you know there's trophy class fish i'm usually not running less than 40 pound um bite guard on that leader and there's some people who believe in having a breaking section of your leader. Like if you're in moving water in a drift boat and yeah. there's a ton of like down trees and you're going to get hooked and maybe you have someone who's not, doesn't have a ton of experience on the oars and you're afraid that you're going to like, you don't want to lose a fly line, mm-hmm. right? Like that right. Like gets expensive in a hurry. Um, you can break down below that like 25 pound breaking section, but usually that 40 to 40 breaks at the knot. Like I've, I have, broken precisely one fly line in the last seven years running 40 to 40 and it was tarpon fishing on dock lights when i got hooked on a dock and got a little greedy so yeah Uh, yeah that happens trying to give kind of the whole continuum of what you can get away with um gear wise and then flies so let's actually let's get knots too because i think that's important uh I tie perfection loops so much that I can tie them with my eye, my eyes closed. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's literally everything from, you know, connecting your fly line to your leader in a loop to loop to um, at the end of my leader before my bike guard, I will actually run a probably a one and a half inch loop at the end of that perfection loop. Mm-hmm. Reason being when I have an 18 inch bike guard on a fly, if I want to switch flies, I'll actually do kind of a quick rig system where I'll just take the whole bite guard off and you can run the fly through that big loop in the leader and pull it off, coil your leader, put it away. Um, But flies, where do you want to start with flies? I showed you a monstrosity before we go in. Yeah. I mean, 
how how big are we talking about? I mean, I know you said you know there's some big ones, and they you can still catch on some smaller flies, but you know what's the average color and size of some of these musky flies that that you guys have been most successful with? Not telling. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm uh, running in my box over here so that you can see the full spectrum of, of what we throw for them um it varies uh, a lot of folks especially when you've been musky fly fishing for a while will try to throw the biggest stuff they can and part of that is seeing like how far you can cast it like i don't know if you've ever casted a big musky yeah. fly before but like hucking out 80, 80 plus feet of line with two false casts or one false cast and sending it like feels pretty good yeah, um, yeah. But it's not always the play. Um, we, we talked about 10 weight rods being kind of like the standard. But as you get into bigger uh, bigger flies, there are applications for highly specialized rods that are way bigger than a 10 weight. Right. We'll get into those. Um, and then there's other applications for, uh, you know, kind of the medium stuff. And so if you're throwing... Let's, let's kind of start uh, seasonally. When we went, I went, I made a trip back to my old stomping grounds in mid October this last year. And I try to make it out there a couple few times a year, but, you know, mm -hmm. pandemic's complicated travel a little bit, at least to that area and, and depending. But when we first went out, the first two days of that trip, we were throwing eight inch Bufords. And it's like, it's a, it's a small high density fishery. I had some trophy class fisheries. We were going to go to a little later in that trip, uh, over in Minnesota. And there's some stuff in Wisconsin that's, I would put in that, um, that same vein. But when we started, it was with eight pound or eight inch, pardon me, like sucker Bufords and a Buford's a really good pattern for like slight current moving current. Cause like when it turns and stops, it kind of drifts. And like, yeah. if you ever watched a minnow, like hit the gas and then stop. They kind of drift afterward. Mm -hmm. Well, that worked. When I say it worked right away, I, my goal for the trip was to get uh, a musky catching a musky on the drone. And like, it was my goal for the whole like two week trip. I was like, this would be a really cool video. Like nobody's seen it. We got that video in the first, I shit you not <laughs> four and a half minutes of recording. Um, Oh, it gets better. I cast it into a tree. Like I was just like belting them out there and I cast into a tree. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I like rip it out of the tree, make up all my like extra line. And about 15 feet from the boat, there was like this underwater, like water, like <laughs> surge. And my cousin, he's like, what was that? I was like, I didn't say it out loud because I was trying to focus. Like, it's really easy to lose your focus. And in my head, I was like, oh, it's freaking musky. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, you know, mid-30s fish eats like right away off the boat, smash it, get it in the net. Um, so we got that one on uh, and it was awesome. But that was like an eight-inch Buford and that was right before turnover. So yeah. turnover for anyone who doesn't know is when the water first gets cold the top of the water column gets colder than the bottom of the water column. It, it happens very quickly. And then the whole water column flips. And that's probably an oversimplification. But what happens is the behavior of muskies, because they're already really picky, and, and we'll get into that in a second, uh, it completely changed. And so all of a sudden, what worked for that first fish and you know a few follows in the first 500 yards of this river, I was like, oh my God, this is just going to be the most ridiculous outing ever turned off. And it yeah. happened instantly. Um, so we spent a day of, okay, how do we adjust? And we figured out that these fish wanted a, wanted a, this is actually a river pig. And this is the, I, my first back to back muskies on this. Nice. Fly. When I say back to back called my buddy with one in the net hung up, collected the boat, cast it again, and got another one. Nice. Um, and the, what they wanted was on a type three, you did drag, and we were in probably a six, eight foot deep mid-sized river. They wanted it dragged as slowly as I'm capable of. Um, yeah. 
And, and I've never experienced that type of fishing for this species because they eat aggressively usually. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, we had, it, it was this like very soft pick up off the bottom type eat and usually right after you like bounce it off a branch i mean you feel it come free from the branch and then like it was this slow pull you strip set fish on and it was really cool um it was a, a brand of musky fly fishing that i'm not used to and um that was great for like two days um yeah we caught i had a four fish day the next day caught six fish in two days and it was all like dragging across the bottom but in the middle of turnover, like right after it got 15 degrees for two days, yeah, the sun came back out and it was like 55 degrees one minute. And then you'd get a North wind for two hours that like, you didn't have the right clothes for it anymore. Yeah. It was brutal. And we couldn't figure these fish out. It was like, all right, we know stuff's changing what's going on. And so he, my cousin's throwing, at this point, I'm throwing the river pig. Cousin's throwing like a seven inch beef. Like we think they're downsizing, but we're not sure yet. Right. And all of a sudden we watched this fish crash a school of shad. And it was like, they're on the small stuff. How small yeah. do we need to go? And this is the fly that we pulled out. And it yeah. is like, it's a six inch magic bullet. And it's, it's, it's like a six inch glider fly that yeah. we have. And, um, my buddy, Jeremy Boulier, who I was mentioning before, um, figured out this pattern and the first time we had gotten an order of these from him we, we have a little pond out back and mm -hmm. we my wife is sitting there with the freaking spotlight trying to keep the fly in it and i'm <laughs> stripping this thing and it's going like all the way across the light and uh i'm going keep the light on and she's going i can't like it just swims unbelievably and uh so he, he's like, I want to try the pink and white magic bullet. And I'm like, I think that's a good idea. I'm going to stick with the thing that I just caught six fish with in two days. And like, yeah. we'll, we'll figure it out. The eat that he got, it was a mid thirties fish, but it was violent. It was, oh, yeah. it was not like a slow pickup off a branch. It was aggressive and it was awesome. Yeah. And we are like, okay, I want one of those too. So naturally <laughs> we put it on and we just start mashing them. I have another four fish day. Oh, nice. And, uh, it was a different brand of eat. It was aggressive and strong and non-hesitant. Uh, so that was in a small high density fishery in Wisconsin. Yeah. And you asked what the range is. So I've given you kind of, okay, we're using stuff in that six to nine inch range for, for high density fisheries there. But then we went to, uh, Minnesota and we fished with Luke Swanson, uh, live in the dream guide service. And Luke is one of our featured guides. Uh, he is an incredible guide. Um, uh, he grew up fishing in, in Northern Minnesota. Um, and he's just, he knows his stuff. Like he, yeah. he's got the Northern Mississippi river fishery, just absolutely dialed. And when I talked to him, I had just picked up a new 12 weight one piece rod and I talk, I was like, should I bring the 12 weight? He's like, no. Nah. I was like, what do you mean? Nah. He's like, like you, you can bring it, but you're going to break it. Like, you <laughs> fish. and I'm like, get out of here. Like, there's not a chance that's true. Uh, it's like, well, what are we throwing? He goes as big as you want to go. And I've got two flies. I'll, I'll show you the one. Actually, I don't have the one I ended up fishing ahead of buddies because I, it's tough because people assume that when you tie flies commercially, you just, your box is like absolutely stacked and I've got, it's getting there. Like I'm, I, I try to piece it together, but like the reality is that I send out so many flies that like hurt my feelings because I'm like, I, I want to put that in my box. <laughs> so we went out to Minnesota and the night before we fished with Luke, he goes, you know, do stuff with bright hot spots like bright orange, bright chartreuse. And I, a few years before, had gone out and fished with Luke, had a like probably a mid, probably a 46 to 48 inch fish eat in the eight and Ooh. come unbuttoned. Um, and, and he and I, he, he's such a good guy. Like, it, it's actually awesome because he cares almost more than you do. Like he yeah. let me have it when this fish came undone and I was pissed. I was like, <laughs> dude, what are you like? 
wait, what? <laughs> like, I didn't understand. Um, he's like, well, like we consulted the GoPro video about who was right afterwards. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he was like, well, like, you know, you were right, but I was right too. And I was like, ah, I don't really like that. Cause I just got reamed. Um, but the reality was that he, I just, I loved that about Luke, how much he cared. And so fast forward to this past fall, he goes, you're going to want bright stuff. And the night before that, that fish ate on a lemon tail. Okay. And I was like, I'm going to have a lemon tail fly deucer for this trip. So I get there and I can't find my chartreuse schlopping anywhere. <sighs> and I'm pissed. I am yeah. not kidding you. I looked for it. I've spent hours. I still haven't found it. Like, oh. I don't know what happened to it. As soon as I got home, I tied the fly that I wished I had. And it is a an 18 and a half inch <laughs> monstrosity that I'm sure there's plenty of purist fly anglers that are like, that's not a fly. And I don't, <laughs> I don't entirely disagree. Mm. But we cast these on specialized 14, 15 plus weight, one piece rods, purely water loaded. Cause if you can carry 70 feet of line with this fly, then I will give you an award because yeah. you're just not going to do it. Uh-uh. Uh, I mean, this thing has like an ounce of weight. Yeah. How many chickens did it take to make that? In the head, at least four chickens. <laughs> at least four um, chickens. <laughs> but no, it's a, uh, you know, it's a fly that's, whereas that, uh, that magic bullet is a darting kind of glide type fly. This is a much different pattern because you rip it in the water column and then it comes down and it has to have enough weight to activate all these tails out of the mm. back and these fish eat it on the, the, the fall. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's on 15. So there's a wide spectrum of what works in terms of flies and rods and gear. And, um, if somebody has questions, if they're like, Hey, all, all I got is my nine weight and this is what I'm running for a line. And, feel free to reach out and ask like, will this work? Uh, I, I feel like part of where we differ from a lot of folks in our space is that we don't try to sell people stuff because I mean, like I've been married for we going on 11, 12 years, been with my wife for 15 years, like supporting a family for that long. Like the reality is you can't just go out always and spend 500 bucks on a new fly combo. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to get into it and you have questions, reach out and ask, be like, can yeah. I do this? If you can't, we'll tell you, if you can, we'll help you make it happen. But you know, we'll also give that recommendation ethically about what might be better when you, when you're able to do that and how to work to that. Um, yeah. it's like we my, know a lot of folks that are selling you stuff too. So, yeah. you know, yeah. my, my daughter is wearing my new vice to, uh, the winter formal, you know, I mean, there are expenses that come up that you don't, you don't think about. I never thought I was going to be paying that much for a dress. I pictured you wear her literally wearing a new vice. And I was like, <laughs> how? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. It was like, oh, I want to get this new vice. No, your daughter needs a dress. What? No, no, I <laughs> no. really need this new vice. Yeah. Good luck. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. Oh, I am too. I am too. I'm just like, I, I had to get her a car. Now I've got to get her a dress. I'm like, come on. She needs to work more hours. And just like us, she can be working her life away in no time. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, man, we are getting ready to run out of time. I'd like to get you back on because a lot of the stuff we didn't even cover that we talked about. Is yeah, there uh, one last thing you want to talk about before we, we get off and plan for another date? How much time do we have? I'm trying to figure out if we can. About 10, 15 minutes. It. Oh, I think we can barrel through it. Okay. All right. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. And happy to jump on again too, if you want. I imagine yeah. folks will have questions. And oh yeah, um, yeah, I'm hoping so. So, the kayak flyer podcast. Uh, <laughs> kayak. I, I'm not a big kayak guy. Like I just <laughs> by by history, not because I don't want to be, just because I didn't have the right one. And my first experience on one is what we're about to share. Um, we we mentioned the little pond out behind our house, and and trying to describe this for folks that are listening and not watching. Um, we've got this dock that goes out to the water line and then it turns hard right and it's parallel to the the shoreline. And it's all behind you, you have these big mature pine trees 
So all that to say, you can't just like cast out into the middle of the pond. Like you're going to cast parallel to shoreline and I fish a lot. So <laughs> the fish that are in that kind of easy cast range don't want to eat after a certain amount or frequency of fishing. And it gets brutal when you've been throwing like a frog fly for two months and catching a ton of fish. And then all of a sudden it shuts off. And then you see these giants crashing in the corner of the pond that you can't reach. Yeah. And so I, I shook a few trees and reached out to a buddy. I was like, Hey, anybody have a kayak? I, I can borrow. I was playing on a, uh, I plan a men's club lacrosse team. And the guy's like, yeah, I can help you. And I'm like, I'm all excited. Right. I'm like, Oh, this is going to be awesome. And I, I'm six two and I'm, I'm a little on the top heavy side, let's just say. And, uh, <laughs> I take this, this kayak out and I like, before I even leave the dock, I'm like, this is a bad idea. Like <laughs> this, this isn't going to go well. Um, get on the water and I kind of row over to the corner first cast into the corner. Nice. Like two plus pound largemouth eats and we strip set. And, and before I say what happened after we strip set, it bears mentioning that there are fish in the 10 plus pound range in this little pond. Like yeah. I, I've seen them a number of times and I caught my first grass carp in that pond. So okay. we, we should revisit carp fishing yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but as soon as I strip set, anyone who does a lot of like bass fly fishing knows like that's a part strip, part trout set. Like you hit the strip set, but you're up as soon as like the fish eats. Cause you know, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah, it's different than a muskie who has a super bony mouth where you really have to keep your rod down and strip set three times, like two or three times. Um, so this fish eats. And as soon as I bring my rod up, I'm like, oh, we leaned a little too far. And <laughs> everything goes into slow motion. And anyone who's on a kayak often listening to this knows exactly where this is going. Uh, just I'm going in and I'm like, what do we need to grab and hold on to before we go in? I lost my favorite pliers, which was terrible, uh, but I saved my hat, my sunglasses, and my fly rod. Yeah. And as soon as I went, it wasn't like going into a pond where you're cold and like you're like, oh, that was a little refreshing or whatever. No, this is a city drainage pond, and it felt like I was swimming through sewage. It was terrible. I felt dirty. I still feel dirty. This happened years ago. And... <laughs> So I, I literally I have my fly rod in my teeth. I've got my sunglasses and my fly box in one hand. And I am like pulling the kayak to shore. And I get there. And I, this is just foul. Like this water is like hotter than a hotel pool. And I get up to shore and I look at my fly line. And it's still down there. And I'm like, no, like there's no way this fish is still on here. And I strip and the fish is still on there and we caught it and there's pictures and there's proof and all that to say, we got a canoe and not a kayak. <laughs> I don't want to go in again. Uh, oh. so that was our kayak story. And we checked the carp box for now. Oh. Uh, I got to tell you though, the never take anything on a kayak that is not strapped down that's you're gonna lose it that's good advice i i miss those pliers i replaced them since but yeah I, yeah but my so. eight-year-old daughter did not get a new dress because of that. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and i guess i like for today the only other thing that i would want to mention is that On top of being incredibly grateful for everybody who supported Musky Town to this point, it made me realize that so many of us fish for more than just musky. And of course, if you fish for musky, you probably fish for smallies and largemouth. And there's some folks in our space, uh, Dustin Hines comes to mind, who look at largemouth as filthy creatures. <laughs> like this moment. But uh, we, we actually are about to, I'm not sure exactly when, it'll be in the next couple months here we're going to launch flats town uh, home for fly home for flats fly fishing so if you're into redfish or snook yep. bonefish permit tarpon gts um, even billfish uh, we want to give people that that outlet to know that you can get not just the stuff you need which is great it's nice to know you right. can get the stuff you need but also that you can talk to somebody who's going to be able to help you like we, we usually someone in our network has the experience to be able to answer the question on the spot. But in the event where we can't, our network is 
pretty vast and we're able to follow up within a day or two and say, Hey, this is exactly what you need in this situation, or this is the tactic that we would try. And again, just growing in the community as anglers together. Um, yeah, we're, we're really excited about Flatstone too. Yeah. And we try, I try to get, and I know the listeners hear this a thousand times. I try to get down to Louisiana once a year. Um, that's my goal every year to get down to Louisiana and catch redfish. Um, but you're talking about taking a spill. I took a spill in Louisiana and I think it was about six hours before that I'd caught a uh, five foot black tip shark in that same water. <laughs> gators down there too. Yeah, there are gators down there. Oh, and that that's water, a hard that, for me, man. That water is gross, but nice redfish. <laughs> nice redfish. We go down in October, and there's a little guy down in Grand Isle. Hopefully, he's going to be be back to to chartering. But he he knows us by name. He knows each one of our quirks. We go out, we catch a bull red or a shark and i mean oh it is and then we're fly we're fly fishing with a lot of spoon flies um there's a there's one company i found that made it it's a little like mylar spoon fly and you or uh, spoon and you tie it on and then you basically we have an epoxy party is what we call it well tie them all together and then i'll pass them off and they'll get epoxied and then they'll get dried and and so we have you know 30 of those when we go down there and so we all have a really great time but you know, flats fishing is something that you know, I I think somebody everybody really needs to go out and try to catch some of those fish on a fly rod just because of how entertaining it is. It's it's oh, really a it's, beautiful thing to do. It's different. I mean, they're so yeah. strong and there's so much different, right? Like you can catch a million bass and you know, peacocks yeah. I think are the in between salt and flats, but yeah. you know, if, if anyone who hasn't caught a bonefish or a redfish, yeah. when a fish like that goes tearing into your backing yeah you, there there's nothing you can do about it you're not going to stop it just keep your hands out of the way you're real so that you don't get wrapped i mean that's the, the weirdest fight i had i was using conventional gear um because we like to eat while we're down there and so we always try to catch a couple of specs for dinner and i was just I messing you around snacks in the boat oh no no we like to, <laughs> no we <laughs> like to catch, we like to catch a couple of fish for dinner and i was uh conventional fishing and we had stopped it was uh it was me and my friend todd my friend nick chaberry who's on the hobie bos team um he uh well he's not on the hobie team he's on the hobie bos circuit anyway um we pull up to a, a grass island there and I'm, we're getting beers out of the cooler and my rod just yanks straight down and then nothing like, well, there mustn't, nah, that's odd, you know? So I'm sitting there drinking my beer, talking and my rods jinks down and I get dragged and I pick it up and start reeling. It's like, I'm reeling in a tire. And everybody's like, what in the hell's going on? And it was a, it was a sheep's head. Nice. And it freaked me out because I'm, I didn't even know they were there that time of year. And, uh, Nick who lived there at the time had never caught one in four years. And it was just, it was the weirdest thing because it was literally like trying to reel in an anchor. I mean, well, it just big like, and strong. And yeah, it do, just, do they suction like catfish? I, that's the only thing I can figure is what it was doing because it just wasn't, it wasn't moving. I mean, I've had largemouth turn on their sides and like yeah. try to suction to the bottom too. So I mean, yeah. it, it, I'm knows? sure they do, but yeah, it was, and it, it tasted really good. Um, it was really good. So it nice. was, uh, it took two of us to get him into the cooler. Um, so yeah, it was, it was wild. But, that's a big yeah, that, one, huh? Yeah, he was, he was quite, he was quite big. Um, I was really, really excited about it. Um, well, we had a good time the whole fishing trip, but yeah, that was, that was definitely my highlight that and the shark were my highlights for that trip. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, if you don't get a chance to fish other fish, you know, and I know that there's differences in, you know, you catch a smallie in one place, you catch a smallie in another, they're going to fight different, but they're all going to be, you know, you know what to expect and to catch some of those fish, like you've never musky fished before you know, Hey, look into it, you know, get a guide. It's, it's worth the money to spend, to go on an, an adventure. I think Especially in my when opinion. you chop it with a buddy. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the things, you know, a lot of folks aren't sure where to start with guides. If you are interested in looking for the right guide, um, we've got a ton of guide relationships and it's one of the things that we, there's really nothing that makes me happier than talking with someone and going back and forth and, you know, comparing notes a couple months down the road or, or yeah. you know, closer to a year down the road and they went on a trip and had like the time of their life. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, and it's, it's easy. Awesome. I mean, if you can afford it, it's easy to do, but like my wife and kids wanted to go to Gatlinburg a couple of years ago and I'm like, that's fine. But one day you're dropping me off because I don't want to go into the town. You know, I don't want to go shop and I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So we just figured, 
okay, on Wednesday, they drove me out to the park where I checked, I'd gotten my permits, everything. I'd found out where to fish. They just dropped me off for like six hours and I fished, That's awesome. you know, and they went and shopped and did everything they want. But if you're going on a family vacation and they're going to do something one day, Hey, look at getting a guide and going to do something because, you know, Family vacations are great, but if you ask me about the third day, I'm wanting to kill my family. So that's a great time to get out and go fish and then come back for the rest of the fun. I, that's an awesome point. You know, you actually just triggered one thing and I got three quick things on oh, the same fine. breath to share about going with a guide on a family vacation. Um, life gets busy, right? Like mm -hmm. as, as dad, like being dad has very real stresses associated with it. Like your, you know, your, your wife, your kids, family, they need you and you always got to be, you know, dad face on like there for them. And like, it makes it sometimes when we go fishing, we focus on wanting to go fishing, like, right. right? Like going on a family vacation and being like, all right, dad's going fishing today. Um, I just got back from a, a, a trip, uh, a, a vacation with my family and made the first decision ever. We, we booked a, a bonefish guide and I brought my wife and my daughter. Oh yeah. And my wife caught her first bone fish. My daughter, we'll, we'll share the footage from it at some point. She, she got wrapped on the knuckles by her first bone fish. And, and like, they're so fast. Like she didn't take her hand off the reel on one and oh, yeah. popped another one. Like she was close to getting her first. Yeah. But all that to say, doing that for your family, like in the short term, like, yeah, you might not get to fish for a day. Yeah. But in the long term, if you can get your family to fall in love fishing with you, yep. then you're going to be way ahead of the game because they're going to want to go fishing on your next yep. family vacation altogether. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So, you know, that that was the first first thing that you triggered that I wanted to mention. And then uh, just two more quick musky town things, just because you asked. Yeah. Um, we are running still through the end of March, the musky town, it's tying season tying contest, um, giving away more than $1,600 in total prizes. Uh, you can win more than one prize. The grand prize is a $500 gift card. Um, so if you're, it doesn't have to be a musky fly either. Like all things predator flies, like even big, like trout meat streamer type stuff right. is eligible. Like we, we don't do a ton in the trout space, but part of this contest is wanting to be inclusive for everyone. I, I think the fly that won last month was a, was a bass fly. Um, and then related to the tying contest, uh, we just announced that starting next Saturday on January 17th, uh, for the next, I want to say next four months, um, we're doing a tying with the pros, uh, video tutorial tying series on musky flies. And th some of those flies are flies that I tie. Um, some of those flies are flies that, um, other top tires in our space tie. And it's, one of these really cool situations where if you have questions and you want them answered, we're going to record, or we're going to record them and then share the links. But if you have questions and you want to ask, like I know that when I was learning to tie some of these patterns, I had dozens of questions. You have a place that you can do that. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this, uh, feel free to send that through social media. Um, if you want to send an email and that's something you prefer, uh, service at muskytown.com. But, uh, like not for the sake of a shameless plug. Like I really do. I, I really do realize the value of, especially when we're learning. And even if you've been tying for a really long time, comparing notes on different techniques and stuff like that, seeing how other people do it, other people who've been really successful do it um, can be the difference between you being successful on, next, on your next trip. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. Uh, tying with the pros and it's tying season, tying contest. Uh, Really, the, the more people we can get to part, yeah, the more people that we can get to participate, um, the more it helps our community continue to come together. Yeah, and you know, I'll I'll piggyback off that real quick and give a shameless plug for my other show. Um, we've got drinking on the fly with uh, me and Kyle Ludwig from Ludwig Outdoors and Fly Tag with Ludwig, and there's a new episode out now in case you haven't checked. Um, but it's a uh, it's a lot of fun because I tie guide flies because I'm like the guide fly master. We've um, got some and, guide flies on the show. Don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah. There's a time and a place, especially when it's 2 a.m. and you got to wake up in three hours to go fishing. That fly <laughs> is not getting eyes. No, it isn't. 
And Kyle ties really, really nice flies. And so we were planning to do a half hour show where I would tie a fly and then he would tie a fly. But now we've got a half hour show where I tie a fly and we talk for 20 minutes and then we talk for five minutes and our next show is 45 minutes because it takes him 40 minutes to tie the fly because it's complex. So Okay, well, a, we're... We just got another episode of Tying with the Pros. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hold Sean to this on the recording that yeah. we're going to get him and Kyle yeah. on the show and we are going to continue the banter and ridiculousness. Yeah. And you think 40 minutes is a long time. You wait till we get into a two and a half hour video. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, uh, definitely check out Kyle. Uh, man, the, his Instagram, I think, is Fly Tying with Ludwig or uh, but at Ludwig Outdoors. But man that man is he's a genius he's a genius he's he's a you look at his flies and it kills me he he made the uh, revelation on this newest episode that's out that he's never tied a woolly bugger um which is ridiculous to me Me (laughs) you've never tied one either god that's blasphemous that's getting down to trout sizes and i got bad eyes you see these i need them Dude, a number one woolly bugger catches bass like crazy. A number one at a, at a slash and a zero, and I may consider it. Oh, we're going to have to talk about that. Definitely. But yeah, this has been great, dude. This has been absolutely wonderful. I, thank you so much for coming on the show. Likewise, I appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, i excited about uh, one meeting you. Thank you to uh, Rick at Oasis for that. And uh, you had a really cool show. This has been a This has been a blast. Thanks. I appreciate it. Guys, we're going to get out of here and we'll check with you all next week.